I am really looking forward to today's conversation with my friend and colleague, the longtime television play-by-play voice of the Lightning, Rick Peckham, who announced last fall that this season, whenever it ends, and hopefully will end later this summer into the fall, will be his last, sadly. But I thought it would be really fun to talk to Rick, not so much about his time with the Lightning, which began in 1995, but the road he took leading up to his time with the Lightning. And we'll get to that. But first of all, Rick, welcome. Great to see you. I haven't actually seen you even on a computer screen since we paused the season. And I know you've done some stuff with the Lightning through Zoom, but what are you doing to fill your days outside of your responsibilities with the Lightning? Well, as things are opening up, Mission, it's great to see you. I don't think we've seen each other really since Toronto, maybe uh, March the 10th. We, we yeah. dispersed after the end of that trip, and and we never saw another game after that. But um, playing a lot of golf, and uh, just we're now being able to, as we know, uh, getting together with friends. Uh, the lockdown is easing up stage by stage, and uh, just trying to get out and about a little bit. And uh, spending some time with, uh, we have one son who lives here in town, so we spend a lot of time with him. And, and uh, so we're filling the day somehow here, but uh, looking forward to uh, putting uh, the cap on this season, that's for sure. So you were born in Dayton, Ohio, and I know you've talked fondly about the Reds. Were you a Reds fan growing up? I was. Yeah, grew up in Dayton, born in Lackawanna, New York, outside of Buffalo, but uh, grew up in Dayton and uh, was a Reds fan. Remember Pete Rose as a rookie. Uh, I remember one incident in particular. My dad worked for a data processing company that had seats at Crosley Field. We were in the third base box seats. They'd get the company seats every once in a while. and So he'd take me to some games. And I was a big Frank Robinson fan. And he gets traded. It was 1965, uh, actually the off season there, with uh, gets traded to the uh, Baltimore Orioles. And Bill DeWitt Sr. was the general manager and so forth, ran the Reds. And he happened to be sitting across the aisle from us. And my dad says, uh, hey, do you want Mr. DeWitt's autograph? I said, no, he traded Frank Robinson. <laughs> so uh, it was one thing that stood out to me and enjoyed going to Crosley Field, saw Willie Mays and Hank Aaron and players like that, um, you know, through those years and then high school years on to Riverfront Stadium and then was on to college and virtually never went back to Cincinnati. So uh, just kind of rooted for the Reds from afar from that. Was Dayton considered Reds country? Like what is the the – dividing line between the Reds and the Indians or did you just like the Reds because they were pretty good when you were a kid and and they were just down the road well growing up in the uh really from what I can remember the 1960s we knew Cleveland was in Ohio but I never went to Cleveland it might as well have been on the moon as far as I was (laughs) concerned um south the western Ohio was definitely Reds country uh Dayton was an hour north in fact Crosley was in the north end of Cincinnati, and I lived in Kettering, which was in the south end of Dayton, so really it was like a 45-minute drive to get down to uh, see Reds games. Didn't make it all that often to Cincinnati. It was when I was a kid, either the Cincinnati Zoo, which is still pretty highly regarded, or Reds games. And, uh, you know, but it's, they now have a single-A team in Dayton that is affiliated with the Reds, so it's always been Reds country. I assume you were, because you still are, also a huge Green Bay Packers fan. Did that start when you were a kid and Lombardi and the Packers? Because you mentioned Cleveland. The Browns were pretty good in those days, too, or they were just not on your radar. I don't know. Maybe it was just kind of uh, uh, the contrarian in me or or something. But since the Bengals didn't come out uh, or didn't come about until 67, 68 the Browns were all we got on TV on Sunday and Jim Brown was going crazy he was you know having his fabulous career at that point in the early 60s and I don't know what got me onto the Packers 
But um, I started rooting for them in 1962. They had won the NFL championship, but, you know, I didn't really know much about that, obviously. I was uh, six going on seven years old. So um, I remember they had a pictorial on them. They started the 62 season 10-0. and 0. And so Life Magazine did this pictorial on them. And right before the Thanksgiving Day game against the Detroit Lions. And by then, I was fully invested in the Packers. And Jim Taylor, their uh, hard-nosed fullback, was my favorite player. So they go into Detroit, play the Lions, and just get trounced 26-14. to 14. Bart Starr gets tackled for a safety, which, what's a safety? I had no idea what a safety <laughs> was at that point. And I think he got sacked about 10 times in the game. And I was just in tears that whole Thanksgiving day. But uh, stuck with the Packers. They won the championship. And Mish, the next year, the first exhibition game, they lose to the college All-Stars. I still stayed with them. So, uh, you know, been a Packers fan ever since. But uh, great, fond memories of, of those teams and watching the games. I would imagine Lombardi – probably didn't mind losing that game to the college all-stars because <laughs> given the kind of coach he was, the reputation he had, that was the perfect way to send his message about avoiding complacency. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that uh, two a days became three days maybe <laughs> at uh, that point. So hockey in Ohio kind of came and went and Cincinnati in the 70s, had a WHA team. Cleveland had an American Hockey League team. I believe, did they have an NHL team briefly as well? They did for two years. The California so, Gold Seals relocated to Cleveland and then merged with the Minnesota North Star. So how and when did your hockey fandom, if that's the right word, start and how did you cultivate that as a kid? Well, Dayton had a team in the IHL, the Dayton Gems. And I don't think there was really anyone of note. Pat Rupp was the big goalie, and he would end up playing for the U.S. Olympic team in 64. But, you know, back then, the United States wasn't expected to do much in the Olympics, even though they had won the gold in 60. But, you know, they didn't have a strong team, and as we know, NHL players, pros weren't allowed to play and all of that. But um, really didn't follow the gems. I went to one game, and for some reason, it never really stuck with me. But uh, right around the late 60s, I was in high school, and uh, Bobby Warren, the Bruins, were coming uh, into vogue. You know, the, the whole building of that team with Phil, Ken Hodge, Fred Stanfield coming from Chicago in a big trade that augmented having Bobby Orr. Jerry Cheevers was now the established goalie, and they had other players who were really emerging as a team. And um, CBS had the game of the week. So I would watch, you know, I, I just watched one game one time, and I thought, wow, this is, for some reason, it now registered with me. This is a fast sport. It's exciting. There were a couple of fights. And I, said, I think I'll watch next week, see what happens. Well, the Bruins are playing the Toronto Maple Leafs, and I think Orr had a hat trick or something, and I was just dazzled by the Bruins and Bobby Orr. So all of a sudden I said, yeah, I'm going to start following this sport. And I started listening to Bruins games on WBZ. They had a sports talk show called Sports Huddle on Sunday nights, which I don't think sports talk even existed really outside of the occasional show in a hot sports market like Boston. And uh, just became a real diehard Bruins fan. Followed him through that whole march to the Cup in 1970. And uh, kind of stayed with the Bruins uh, right up until, uh, I would say, you know, late 70s. So we get to college at Kent State University, which is about 40 miles southeast of uh, Cleveland. They had a WHA team. They had an American League team, the Cleveland Barons. And the the guy who's really started the club hockey program at Kent State, Steve Albert, well-known sportscaster, youngest brother of Marv Albert, Al Albert, played goal in professional hockey, actually played in Toledo in the IHL, among other stops. Steve started the club hockey program, program at uh, Kent State. Well, he graduates, gets the job to announce for the Cleveland Barons, 
the next year, uh, 72, they, you know, the WHA begins. Cleveland Crusaders are one of those teams. They signed Jerry Cheevers away from uh, uh, the uh, Bruins. And Steve would, you know, set me up with tickets every once in a while and a press pass or whatever, because I was working for the uh, school radio station. So I'd, I'd get to go to Crusader games, got to see Gordy Howe play with his sons, with the Houston Arrows and so forth. It's pretty interesting. Well, eventually, I think by 76, the Crusaders go out of business. Now the California Golden Seals, leaving Oakland, they move to Cleveland, adopt the Barons' name. All this time, they're playing in what is still new, the Richfield Coliseum, which is south of Cleveland, believe me. At Kent State, I was 25 minutes from the Richfield Coliseum. I was closer to the games than most of the Cleveland fans. And it showed because they drew about 80,000 <laughs> people. <laughs> but they needed a training camp spot. They chose Kent State, so I got to know some of the people with the Barons. And they gave me a press pass. Come on up tape practice your play-by-play -play anytime you wanted so I'd go up there with a tape recorder and, and practice play-by-play -play, and it was NHL action I mean I remember the Blackhawks coming in with Stan Makita and Tony Esposito and and you know you've got guys like that on your tape um, I also had full you know access to do interviews and occasionally we'd run them on our, our uh, college station on the sports reports. I remember interviewing Phil and he was on my resume tape to get a job out of school. He was playing for the Rangers and uh, the tape ends with the, the sound bite from Phil where we were just talking about the schedule. They were in a real busy time. And he says, we've got to have luck with injuries. He says, you've got to have luck in this game. Anybody that tells you you don't have to have luck is full of it. And that's how my tape ended. <laughs> with that sound bite. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. And, um, you know, they, they ended up leaving the NHL the following year. I graduated in 77 and went on from there. Long story short. No, no, no. That's a great story. I'm going to rewind just a little bit, though, uh, because I'm wondering, both as a kid and then as you were getting into broadcasting, were there broadcasters that had an impact on you in terms of the type of announcer you wanted to be? Well, from what I could listen in terms of picking up hockey games, it was, uh, uh, you know, the Bruins announcers at that time, Bob Wilson had that year of 1970, I want to say he had gone to St. Louis to do TV. He had been with the Bruins, went to St. Louis, then came back. So Fred Cusick switched to television and Bob came back to do the radio. So I'd hear Bob Wilson do games all the time through that period. Uh, Dan Kelly, KMOX St. Louis, you could get that anywhere around the world, it seemed. Uh, so you could, you could hear Dan Kelly all the time. He and Gus Kyle would be doing the games uh, for, for the Blues. So I probably was more influenced by Dan Kelly than anybody. Um, and once I got to college and I was working with this club hockey team and announcing games, I really started to focus on okay, I'm going to be a hockey announcer if I can. Uh, so I focused more on that sport and kind of pulled away from the other sports. I remember as a kid having that game Stratomatic Baseball. Remember that game? Yeah. <laughs> now I think it's, it's a game you can play on the computer, but when I played it, it was, it was an actual board game almost, and you had player stats and – I had the whole 1981 season. I'm a little bit younger than you, obviously. So I was, you know, 11, 12. And I would play, you know, the A's would play the Indians or something. I had every team. And I would play the game. And I would announce the game. <laughs> you know, I had a little transistor radio. Yep. And I had it tuned to no station. So if you turned it on, you got static. But, of course, it sounded like crowd noise, right? Real dorky stuff. So if there's a home run, you know, I'd announce the home run. I'd turn the radio on. You'd hear the, the fake crowd noise. And I guess what I'm saying is that some on, on some level, I was drawn to announce, even though in my head I was going to be like the shortstop for the Mets or something like that. 
that definitely wasn't in the cards. Did you have an idea in your younger years that this would be something that you would do for your career? You don't have to have a stratomatic baseball story, but I'm just wondering if when you got to Kent State, did the light bulb go on or did you have an idea that maybe you might be drawn to this type of work? Well, I think back to grade school and I was just so interested in watching and listening to sports on radio and TV. And there were very few games of any type that were on TV. The Reds TV package, believe it or not, was 35 games. <laughs> so anytime they were on, I mean, now it's 150, right? right? Anytime they were on, you know, I was glued to the TV. And I've often thought, you know, would I have actually graduated from grade school if there was as much sports on TV then as there is now, <laughs> because I would have been you know, watching as much sports as possible. And I, I started to realize you know, that I really was drawn to watching and listening to the announcers, and I knew who all the announcers were. And without you know, saying, hey, I wanna be one of these guys, I was drawn to, um, paying attention to who was doing the games. And I even came up with some imitations of some of the guys. I could do a Ray Scott, which was, you know, he was the Packers uh, TV announcer and very apropos for how he called a game on TV. You know, he wasn't describing, you know, an over the shoulder catch and well, we could see that he would say, you know, a typical Scott imitation would be star dollar touchdown. <laughs> you, know, you can see the pass being completed and Dowler's going to score and Green Bay gets a touchdown. But, um, you know, so it's funny. I could entertain my buddies in grade school a little bit with that without thinking, you know, career-wise, still playing sports. Got into to, uh, playing high school basketball and didn't make the team my second year. And we had actually kind of a pseudo radio TV setup at high school. And this was pretty good for the, the time that it was going on in the fact that the uh, basketball coach, longtime coach at Alder High School, uh, Joe Petroselli, would videotape the home games. Well, Mike Forens, I don't know if that name rings a bell, mm -hmm. he would go on to announce for the Washington Capitals, Dallas Stars, Hartford Whalers. He was in high school and a couple of years ahead of me, very enterprising, you might say, uh, student and he talked Joe into letting him put a voice to that tape and as it turned out by the time I got involved in this we had a two camera operation and we had people who were interested in broadcasting from a technical standpoint that were running cameras we had a little switcher one camera was fixed on the scoreboard I mean I, we're all watching replays of games, right? No matter if it's football or basketball or whatever. And until Fox instituted the Fox box, you didn't have that constant score and time in the screen. I don't think we were uh, expecting to be groundbreaking technicians here, but somehow we had that in and would liberally, you know, the, the guy was operating a switcher, um, you know, would bring that into the picture. We had a pretty good production. Now, this was just on tape. It wasn't broadcast. And so we expanded it to uh, audio tape. And I'd go to road football games for the high school or basketball games. I have to call ahead to get a space on the press table. And we had sponsors. We had a local pizzeria and the Coca-Cola bottlers locally uh, sponsored. And the idea was we would play these tapes back in the cafeteria for students. Outside of the, you know, the videotape of the basketball game, it didn't draw much of a crowd. But uh, that's really how I got started in, in thinking about becoming a broadcaster. And that became my pursuit from that point on, my last two years of high school and uh, going on to Kent State from there. You mentioned Kent State. You graduated in 1977, which means that you, you arrived in 1973. That's only three years after the shooting on campus with the student protesters and the National Guard. Did that incident, I don't even know if, what the right word is, whether it's effect, deter you in any way? Like, was that on your radar at all when you chose Kent State as the place that you wanted to go? 
Um, not really because it had happened, like, as you say, three years before things had settled down. Um, not really. It was more or less the opportunity to go to a school in state, the best chance I would have to, um, you know, further a career in broadcasting. And it worked out very, very well. By the time I got there, you know, there were, and there still are, memorials May 4th every year, and it was still fresh in a lot of people's minds at that point. So I learned a ton about what had happened in that time where I, you know, you were aware of it, and it was a horrible tragedy, and how it was handled by the state of Ohio at that point and in, in sending the National Guard in with live ammunition and so forth in a situation that you can debate whether it was called upon or to do that or not. Um, you know, I really wasn't in on the details, you know, I was in high school, but I wasn't, you know, I didn't have an ear to the ground to that kind of stuff. I was just all sports and getting through school and that kind of thing. So I learned a lot about what had happened there when I got there. Um, and I think by the time I got there, the guardsmen were cleared of charges, criminal charges, and then there were civil suits. I would later work for the town uh, radio station and kind of assist the news director while he was covering the trials on the civil suits. So, you know, you were very aware of what was going on at that point, just from the standpoint of me reading the news in the afternoon after my classes. You mentioned in depth all of the experience that you got at Kent State, both in terms of the the college station, also the work that you did in Cleveland. So you're heading toward graduation. Clearly you decide you want to pursue this. You want a job in hockey and you get a job right out of the hop <laughs> with Rochester. How did all of that unfold? How did you find out about the job? Tell us about the process from the point that you applied until you actually got the position. Well, at the time in the NHL, farm teams were in the American League, which was really in, in tough shape at that point. Uh, the 76-77 season, the AHL had six teams. And as it turned out, my first year, they expanded and, and grew in strength through the years because teams would also put their affiliates in uh, the International Hockey League, which was more the Midwest and the Central Hockey League, which you got into the Plains, you know, Kansas City and Oklahoma City and places like that. So there were many minor leagues. The IHL actually was, was by that point, um, kind of a third tier, kind of like double A AA to AAA kind of thing. Um, but the Central League and American League were on a par, and the affiliates were kind of split that way. But of course, the NHL was not uh, you know, a big league at that point, maybe 18 teams. Um, so it, it's certainly not what it is now. But I just canvassed all the minor league teams and, um, you know, just kind of approached it that way. My issue at that point was the fact that I was, I was kind of reserved, very reserved in terms of going out and, and pushing myself and selling myself and that kind of thing. It wasn't that I didn't have the, the initiative to do it. I certainly did, but I didn't know how to do it. And I was just a little reticent in, in those situations. So that was kind of a daunting situation there. And, and that, so a lot of those teams I didn't end up following up with, but the American league I did. Um, Rochester and the new franchise in Maine were the two that had interest in me. And I ended up, uh, things worked out better with Rochester than with Maine was hired, uh, I guess I started in August, was when uh, I finally went to work for them. But you know, for a long time, and I'm sure if there's any uh, young aspiring professionals out there, whether it's broadcasting or whatever, who happen to be listening in, you know, they go through this where you're not getting a response and you're like, man, I, I was selling shoes, <laughs> you know, in my summer job went back to that when school was over. I said, am I going to be selling shoes now? <laughs> am I, or am I going to become a broadcaster? Well, finally, things started to turn around, and I got the Rochester job in August. 
of 77 and, and started there. This may be a sidebar. Did Mike Emmerich get the Maine job that same year? Because I know he worked in Maine. He did, yes. He, uh, I went in and talked to Gil Stein, was the uh, gentleman who represented the Flyers. That was their farm team. And uh, I'll be honest with you, he, he was not – I'm glad I didn't take that job because it was, hey, kid, you're going to take the job or not? You know, it really wasn't much in terms of uh, we're going to pay you this and whether you're going to get benefits and what your responsibility is going to be. Hey, you want the job or not? I really was surprised. Didn't know anything about the Flyers. You find out later what a professional organization that's always been, why he would approach it that way. Well, they were going to name Bob McCammon the head coach. Bob was um, with uh, Port Huron, and the announcer was Mike. Mike had been there a few years, and he was going to come in and cover the announcement, and he was very interested in the job. And so, you know, Stein said to me, hey, look, you're either going to take this job or, you know, this other announcer is coming in, and if he convinces me he should get it, he should get it. And I said, well, you know, I've got to talk to the people in Rochester. I'm a little stunned by this whole development. And, you know, I promised them I would come in for an interview and I'm going to talk to them because you're offering me a job with no details and they're interested in me as well. You know, I'm going to be fair about it. So he says, all right, that's the way we'll do it. And I called Rochester. They said, come on in. You got the job. I said, well, I'm not going to mess around with these people and worked out great for Mike, obviously. And it's worked out fabulous for me. So pretty happy with the whole result of it. As is standard for minor league broadcasters, your job entails a lot more than just broadcasting. You're doing PR, you're doing sales, you're doing player promotions, you're driving the Zamboni if need be. I never did that. I don't know if you did. But I'm wondering, nope. how, did you, how did you enjoy the job outside of the booth? I was overwhelmed the first few months. I can tell you that to where the, the message pretty much from management was you prepare for your broadcasts on your own time. You know, <laughs> like a game day, you've got this responsibility, this responsibility, this responsibility, and then you go do your game. So, they, you know, you're hired as the broadcaster, but that's not really what they're interested in. They want a body, like you say, who's going to do sales, which I had not done any sales at all. And and, you know, I was pretty shy at that point, as I pointed out. And, and so that was tough, you know, swallow hard and try to make a sale. And you really didn't know what you're doing. PR wise, the PR I had done at Kent State for the hockey club was nothing compared to, um, you know, the PR that was required for a professional organization in a market that I had no idea about. I didn't know anything about Rochester. And you know, we had a staff of, I think, five people. So everybody was doubling up. You, I'm sure, went through the same thing with Hershey in those years. So you, you get caught up as it's going along and, and things settle down. But it was pretty rough there the few, first few months. One part of the job is, as you mentioned, PR, and that includes putting together the game notes, which are on a whole other level now than they were certainly when I was working in the minors, and I'm sure for you as well. But I always found that as a broadcaster, it helped me to assemble the notes. It was actually enhancing my prep. Did you find that as well? That was really my only chance to prepare outside of what I could do at home the night before uh, was putting together those game notes. Plus, we had an insert in our program. I'm sure that, uh, you know, programs. I'm sure fans now, as they go into Amelie Arena, the ushers very happily will hand you a program which has some very basic generic lineup information. And we kind of were like that. We had a, we called it a magazine to make it more valuable and at least in appearance that would change every month with feature articles and stuff that I would write or go out and I was supposed to hire writers and, and vet them in terms of their ability to write and let them cover the team and so forth. But a game insert for that particular game also required you to come up with notes. So it wasn't just the stat sheet or a couple of stat sheets for the press notes. It was also, um, you know, Jim Petty has got a shutout streak of 110 minutes or whatever. And, 
you know, Rick Aduno, who ended up leading the, the AHL and scoring that year. Um, you know, he's got a 10 game point streak with so many points in this span. You know, the Amherst are uh, 12 and two, you know, the stuff that you and I read now routinely in the notes that Brian Burns does such an excellent job on it for the Tampa Bay lightning home games. You know, you started to have to come up with that stuff. But like you say, I mean, that was a great way to prepare because that was locked in your brain. You didn't have to spend half an hour searching for notes and then trying to incorporate them into your preparation. One of the things that amazes me about you is your ability to recall stats and numbers seemingly at the drop of a hat. And I don't know if you have an element of a photographic memory or you've just been really good throughout your life with numbers. Uh, is that something that comes naturally to you? Or is there a lot of work that goes into it that maybe I'm not seeing that's allowing you to retain a lot of those statistical numbers? I think it's a habit that uh, probably was ingrained from back to when I was a kid. Um, like you, you know, you were, you're just voraciously reading everything you could about Major League Baseball or the NFL, or I was an NBA fan when I was eight years old, and, and uh, college basketball, the, the little you could learn about the NCAA in those days, but I was drawn to the stats, and I knew the stats for everybody. I knew all the players, their numbers. Um, I remember sitting in a class one day, and, and this girl next to me is like, what are you doing? And I was sitting there in a notebook, selecting my all pro team for the NFL, <laughs> you know, write names down, you know, thinking, okay, well, this guy threw for 36 touchdowns. So, you know, he should probably get the quarterback spot, but I was just kind of drawn to those stats in those days. If and it were debate I, class, you would have been fulfilling the obligation, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, I think it was something else, but uh, nevertheless, I think that's where it started. So your time in Rochester begins, I looked up their, their franchise history, those, those late 70s teams did struggle. But then Mike Keenan comes in as head coach, and he had not been a head coach for very long. I guess he'd been in junior hockey for a year or two, and almost immediately the Amherst become elite, and you do win a Calder Cup with Mike Keenan behind the bench as head coach. What was it like working with him, a younger Mike Keenan than the guy that – we got to know as an NHL coach. I really, you know, occasionally you'd have a problem with Mike because he was very demanding. I never really got much of a view of how demanding he was with the players. That was all in the locker room, and I'd only hear that from the players on the outside. But um, he was great to work with. Uh, we became fast friends, and and. Uh, uh, that was his first professional job. He had been in Peterborough. He had players like Larry Murphy on his uh, team in Peterborough, and they lost in the Memorial Cup Finals. Uh, Doug Carpenter was the coach. I, you may remember him coaching the Devils, but he coached Cornwall. They had Dale Howarchuk and Scott Stevens. And uh, Brian Murray, the late Brian Murray, was coaching Regina. They were the host team in that uh, Memorial Cup Final. I guess it was 79. Um, but, uh, I can't remember who was on his team. Anyway, Murray ends up winning the tournament, but there was a lot of acrimony between Keenan and Murray over something that had happened during that tournament. Of course, Brian Murray becomes the Hershey head coach pretty soon after, uh, Mike gets hired by, uh, Buffalo. Scotty Bowman was running the Sabres at that point. First couple of years of the Sabre affiliation, was more a chance for Bowman to come in, take over, and clean out some contracts. We ended up with, um, just throw some veteran names out there. Jacques Richard, who um, I mean, he passed away a number of years ago, but he was a pretty good scorer on the WHA and um, in the NHL, but he didn't fit Scotty's system, and Scotty had no patience for that. Ron Schock, who played for a long time with the Penguins, uh, he was playing out his contract with Buffalo. He was sent to Rochester. Richard was there. Yvonne Lambert, who, of course, was a part of a lot of those championship teams with Brian Engblom and, and the great Canadiens, was finishing out his contract with the Sabres. And 
spent time with us. By the time he got to us, that team was ready to win. As you pointed out, we won the 83 Calder Cup and went far in the playoffs in 82. But Mike coming in, he had a bumpy road with the veterans because I remember our first bus trip, we play a home game on, home game on a Friday night. I think we're going to Springfield. And he wanted lights out on the bus at 1130. <laughs> and the guys, you know, there's a couple of cases of beer on the bus. This is old time hockey. So the veterans are like, John Bednarski, Paul Crowley are looking at him like, what are you talking about? And so they get a little face off in the aisle of the bus. And I guess they found some common ground, but he, you know, came in with some very stern ideas and it was interesting to, to be around him. At one point, um, he was very good to me as a broadcaster and very open about how he was doing things on the team. And he wanted to bring in new ideas all the time. and he and Scotty were kind of, you know, uh, bumping into each other a little bit on, you know, because Mike wanted to spend money and Scotty didn't want to. Well, Mike brings this coach from Brockport State University in as an unpaid assistant. All he had on his staff was Phil Meir, a longtime veteran goaltender who was a player and assistant coach. Well, you know, I'm trying to get press notes done on a game day, and here's this unpaid assistant. He's at the copy machine, and he's there for like an hour. And I'm like, God, who is this guy? Well, it was E.J. McGuire, who, you know, ended up working for the yeah. Flyers and some other – then the National Hockey League and ran Central Scouting and unfortunately passed away from cancer. But, you know, E.J. gets pulled into the fray here with, with Mike. So it was an interesting time to be involved with uh, that group at that point. And the momentum – in the city of Rochester, a great sports town, used to having very successful teams with the Amherst and the old Rochester Red Wings baseball team. Uh, it was really growing, and, you know, Mike was laying down the law, but uh, they were getting the wins and uh, put together some great teams. What do you remember about that 83 Calder Cup run? Well, uh, it was one where you, it was kind of like the, the lightning – going from 03, your first year, and then to the championship year. You know, they're ready to win. And you had that feeling as a broadcaster where they, they ended up losing a tough playoff series the year before. Um, but they'd made so many strides from being a downtrodden team where I think Mike's first year we had 51 players. And I remember him telling me, thank God they've got the names in the back of the jerseys. I would never <laughs> know who to put out on the ice at a given time. And um, so by the time that you, you get to 82, 83, things have really settled down. It's a well-oiled machine and they're ready to win. And it was a team that had everything. We had a guy, Gary McAdam, who I think scored, you know, maybe 10 shorthanded goals that year. They could score in any situation. They uh, had great goaltending in Mir and also Jacques Cloutier, who would be a, uh, longtime assistant coach in the National Hockey League. And you had a veteran presence in Lambert. Jordy Robertson, uh, still a very good friend of mine, uh, who still lives in Rochester, would lead the league in, in scoring. And he was centering the top line. And you had all sorts of prospects on that team. I think uh, Mike McKenna saw time in Buffalo. Mike Moeller, Randy Moeller's uh, older brother, uh, would see time in the NHL off that team, Mal Davis and some others. So it was, it was a stacked team, but, you know, Mike kept the lid on things and, uh, you know, they marched to the Calder Cup that year. After that year, Keenan gets the job with the Flyers, so he departs. Then a year later, you depart, and you get the opportunity to do TV with Hartford. How did that situation unfold? Well, um, the best part, certainly, from the Rochester experience was meeting my wife, Vicki, and I think we were dating about a year and a half before we got married, August 26, 1984, and so we're all set to move into an apartment, different part of town, and she's been decorating a little bit, and Vicki's from Rochester, her family's right there, and a uh, tight-knit Greek family, and so we're all ready to settle down to start another year. And as far as the Amherst were concerned, Joe Crozier had coached that year after Mike left. We got to the finals, lost to Maine. And um, 
then Joe moved into another job with the Sabres, and Jim Schoenfeld was named the head coach of the Amherst. Well, I ended up presiding over, you know, hosting his, uh, his press conference to announce him as the head coach. I think two months in, he was hired by Buffalo that particular season, and John Van Boxmeer took over. But, you know, we're, we're preparing for another season. So then, still during training camp, um, two weeks after we got married, I get the call that uh, Hartford's looking for, or Sports Channel New England is looking for an announcer, and can you come in for an interview? So three weeks, by the time three weeks have passed, I'm hired by the Whalers, and this new apartment is, <laughs> we've got to, you know, sublet it and work all that stuff out, and, you know, Vicky's like, what, we're moving to Hartford? And she had a teaching job. She'd been teaching for a few years. So she had to get out of that. We get to, uh, to Hartford just in time for the season to start. So that happened very, very quickly. And the Whalers weren't really on too many people's radar at that point. So I didn't know much about that roster or the personnel. So it was a uh, you know, real uh, situation where you had to dig in and, and uh, uh, really learn as much as you could in a, in a quick uh, fashion. Hearing that story, two things jumped out at me immediately. First of all, they contacted you. So typically, and you mentioned this coming out of Kent State, like you were soliciting teams and sending demos. Did you know about the job? That, yeah. No, I didn't. I, I, you know, I knew that uh, I had sent a tape to the Flyers at one point where they started their spectrum. Uh, Oh, Prism Network is what they started. And I think they ended up hiring Bob Gallerstein, who you hear on Sirius XM doing updates now, and he had announced in the American Hockey League and so forth. Um, so I was kind of on the radar from doing that, and I still had sent out tapes after we had won okay. the Cup in the following year. So I was still in that process. I was working toward getting an NHL job. So, yeah, I was kind of canvassing a lot of uh, – situations that I felt, you know, might to prove uh, fruitful. I don't specifically remember what I had sent to Sports Channel New England, but I think Sports Channel as a whole, they're kind of like Fox Sports where they're affiliated and, you know, Sports Channel New York carried the Islanders, Sports Channel Philadelphia became Prism, and some other regional sports networks were cropping up. And uh, I think that's how uh, they learned about me. The other thing that's interesting about the move to Hartford was that you went from the radio announcer with the Amherst to the television announcer with the Whalers. And it's not unheard of, but more common is for the radio announcer and the minors to get the radio job in the NHL. Had you had television experience with the Amherst at all? Had they done games on TV? And what was that transition like to go to the NHL in a TV role as opposed to what you'd been doing regularly throughout your career to that point? Well, uh, we had done TV in Rochester. As I mentioned, you know, as the interest was growing and the team was getting strong, um, the PBS affiliate locally would pick up some games. And then that morphed into uh, the CBS affiliate picked up games. And then I think we got handed off to the ABC affiliate. And so their sports director would, uh, you know, serve as a host. And my regular color guy, which was, who was John Bednarski, who played a long time in the American League, one of the great players in that league, and uh, with the Rangers in Edmonton in the WHA and NHL, uh, he was a great guy, color guy, and we worked together. We just shipped over. And Pete Weber, who now, you know, is doing – uh, radio for the Nashville Predators, but he has been all over the place in terms of his professional experience and one of the great broadcasters we have in sports, uh, was working in Buffalo at the time. He was the sports director of uh, a radio station there. And so he would come over and do radio when we'd switch over. So this happened at certain key regular season games and then some of the playoffs. When we won the Calder Cup, it was actually um, – uh, I was going to say it was TV, but I think it was radio. But we did some some playoff games 
uh, on TV in Rochester as well. So I had enough to put a tape together, certainly from that, to send out to some uh, TV networks. One of Rochester's biggest rivals when you were in Rochester, and even I remember this when I was in Hershey between Rochester and the team that was in Binghamton at the time, they were the Binghamton Rangers. But when you were in Rochester, they were the Binghamton Whalers. Great logo, too, because they just shifted that H to a B, right? But you go into their rink, and every time something bad happens for Rochester, you're hearing Brass Bonanza, right, for Binghamton. Now you're working for the Whalers, and you're hearing Brass Bonanza when something good is happening for the Whalers. Did you have, like, I don't know, some kind of internal shock to hear Brass Bonanza in a different context when you got to the Whalers? Yeah, it definitely wasn't on my hit parade <laughs> when I was in Rochester, that's for sure, because we had a couple of knockdown, drag out battles with them in the playoffs. Ricky Lee, who would go on to coach the Whalers and uh, was a great player in the WHA days for that team, um, was coaching when Keenan was coaching Rochester, and they, they didn't get along at all, and we had some bench clearers, I think, with them. So by the time you get to Hartford and you're hearing – Brass Bonanza, and there were nights where you'd hear it like eight or ten times. You'd get beat eight to two or something uh, at the Broome County Arena and trudge home on the bus two and a half hours to Rochester, and that song's ringing in your ears. So that definitely was something I had to get used to, as well as seeing some of these guys. Ray Newfeld sticks out as a guy who was big on those Binghamton teams and had some nice years with the Whalers as they started to put together a pretty decent team in the middle to late eighties. And, you know, you get to know those guys, you realize they're, they're great guys, just like the people that you'd known, but you know, it was, it was a different situation. That's for sure. The hockey world is an interesting one. You switched organizations. Essentially you went from Rochester, Buffalo to Hartford with Binghamton. I remember we had an affiliation switch in Hershey. So my first two years in Hershey, we were affiliated with Philadelphia and one of Hershey's big rivals was a team that played out of Cornwall, which was affiliated with the Quebec Nordiques. And the second year of my time in Hershey, we were with the Flyers, the Nordiques moved to Colorado. So it was Colorado's affiliate. But after the 96 season, the Flyers moved out of the spectrum. They put a minor league team in the old spectrum, the Philadelphia Phantoms, and Hershey needed a new affiliation with a team. So we affiliated with Colorado. So it's kind of like all these Cornwall players that were public enemies, number one, two, three, four, five, six, and Hershey now were wearing the Hershey uniform, and the former <laughs> Bears were now playing for the new arch rivals. Philadelphia and it was a really strange dynamic I thought of that when you mentioned some of these old Binghamton Whalers now <laughs> playing for Hartford or being affiliated with Hartford but one guy that you certainly had good memories of hearing you talk about him was Jerry Cheevers who became your broadcast partner in Hartford what was that like working with a guy that you followed you mentioned your love of the Bruins started when he was right in the middle of those great teams he was just up the road from you in Cleveland when he went to play there. So what did you think when you found out you would be working with Jerry Cheevers? Well, Jerry had been the coach of the Bruins at that point. Um, and I want to say my first two years in Hartford, Don Blackburn, who had coached the Whalers the year Gordie Howe played in the NHL. He had been with the organization as, as the WHA ended. And Blackie was my a color guy for the first two years. And then Jerry was coaching the Bruins at that point. He was a good friend of Ron Ryan who ran Sports Channel New England. So he got fired midway through one of those years and was scouting for the Bruins. And then the next year, you understand that, you know, Don Blackburn's not getting his contract renewed. And, um, you know, hey, Jerry's going to be your new partner. And I was like, wow, you know, this is, this is going to be interesting to see you know, here's a guy like you, you detailed that uh, when I became a hockey fan, he was the goalie of the Bruins and had that stitched mask and, and uh, you know, one of the big bad Bruins. So it was, it was really interesting. We found out 
Now, going back to when he was with the Cleveland Crusaders, he left the Bruins, got a huge contract with the Crusaders. They had training camp at Kent State, at the Kent State Ice Arena. And so we started off, the first game we ever did was an exhibition game between the Whalers and the Pittsburgh Penguins. And I can't remember the town in Quebec that we were. It must have, it wasn't Quebec City. Um, where it was, but Mario Lemieux was supposed to play for the pink. He didn't end up playing in the game for some reason, but we're in this tiny little junior rink. And I remember our, our game camera kept catching one of the beams in the roof. You know, it was the, the press box was that low. The ceiling was that low that, you know, in the game shot, as you're following the play down the ice, you're catching part of a beam. It was not really made for television. But Jerry and I got through that, and we just started talking about, uh, uh, you know, commonalities. And I was asking him about Kent State. He goes, yeah, we used to go to uh, this sports bar in uh, Kent, the crazy, it's a crazy horse. He goes, yeah, that's it. And I said, yeah, I remember you were in there. You had a Panama hat on, and you were judging a dance contest. He goes, <laughs> you were there? <laughs> And so that kind of broke the ice. I mean, typical Jerry Cheevers, right? You would expect him to be in the middle of something like that. And he was. And uh, so, you know, the stories start flowing from there. No one can tell a story like Jerry Cheevers. And just one of the funniest, most enjoyable human beings to be around. I don't care what you're doing. He, he Nothing phases the guy. And he's always fun to be around. You know, if nothing's happening, he's going to find something fun to talk about or a story that's going to make you laugh. And all of a sudden, you enjoy a, a difficult situation. Very special human being. So you fast forward a couple of years. We're in the lockout shortened season of 94-95. It would be your last season with the Whalers. But you segue right to the Lightning for the 95, 96 season, how did the dominoes fall in that situation that you were able to, to land on your feet with Tampa Bay? Well, very, very fortunate. Uh, certainly a, a key break for me and our family. Uh, by that point, uh, my oldest son, Alex was four when I made the move here. My younger son, Matthew was two and my wife was teaching in Connecticut. She had a really solid job there. It's a great uh, state for, for education, as you know, uh, you know, being a Yale grad and so forth. But um, the Whaler situation was not so great. And Peter Carmanos had bought the team for the lockout season of 94-95. And as it worked out, my contract was up after 93-94. Bad timing there because you know, they would sign me to become an independent contractor, which meant you only got paid if the games got played. Well, half the season was lost there. We played 48 games and didn't start till I think January 17th or something like that. Um, I had a couple other things I was doing. I was producing corporate videos for a company based in Hartford called Loctite Corporation. You might have heard of Super Glue. It was mm -hmm. invented in sure. Hartford. Um, and that company was started they've since been, you know, purchased by a conglomerate from Europe, but uh, that kept me busy. Plus a name that uh, I think fans would recognize that they follow soccer, John uh, Paul Della Camera, who does a lot of soccer for ESPN. He's done the world cup, ABC, you name it. JP has, has been there in the soccer world. He was doing a lot of games for ESPN international. Keep in mind, Hartford is, you know, just a 30 minute drive from Bristol, the home base of ESPN and their international operations back then were, were kind of uh, rudimentary at, at best because they, they and TNT were battling for the, the rights to show sports events in Asia Pacific, um, Latin America. Europe was pretty much closed off to them at that point, but those were kind of the two battlegrounds for international television and broadcast rights. So um, JP was doing what they would do is like TNT had NBA games on Tuesday and Friday and ESPN international had the rights to show them in Asia Pacific and Latin America. So they would take that TNT broadcast and put a, 
ESPN face on it, basically, cut out all the promos, which show it on delay so they would have time to, to uh, you know, make the necessary changes, avoid TNT promos, things like that. And he wanted to do more soccer. You know, doing two nights a week of NBA was going to prevent him from doing more soccer. So he calls me up out of the blue. I had known JP. He had been the voice of the Springfield Indians at that point uh, for a couple of years. Great guy. And said, could you do NBA? Well, sure. You know, and I had the time. So I was doing a ton of NBA on just off a monitor at the ESPN studios that would be broadcast to other areas of the world. Tim McCormick, who I think is still doing color on the Big Ten Network and, and some other networks, uh, former NBA center and a University of Michigan product, was my color man through all that. And uh, I did NBA in 94, um, 95. And then the following year, my first year actually working with the Lightning, I was still based in Connecticut, and I could still – do some NBA games um, on the side that season, 95, 96. So that was great experience, a lot of fun, and it really helped me out of a tight spot there. But at the same time, you could see Carmanos wasn't interested in keeping this team at Hartford. He was button heads with the state uh, government. He was button heads with people who controlled uh, the luxury suites, there were all sorts of revenue battles going on, and you could see he was going to be looking to move that team. And we would hear rumors from week to week, oh, they're going to Las Vegas, or the Whalers are moving to North Carolina, or the Whalers are moving to Columbus because Hermanos' wife was from there. Well, the NHL wasn't going to go for any of that, we know now, but you didn't know at the time, right? And I'm thinking here, a young family, I don't know what's, what's going on here, and as it turned out, Jerry and I kind of got pushed to the side in terms of what they wanted in their broadcast. So we could see the handwriting on the wall. And so I, you know, I had been offered by the network a three-year deal, but as I told them, I said, what am I going to announce if they pull out and I've still got two years left on my deal. And so I, I took a one-year deal in my last year there. And I said, well, I'm just going to roll the dice and see what happens. Well, the, the year comes and goes. Uh, I'm not working there anymore. And as it turned out, as you mentioned, the Avalanche or the Nordiques moving to become the Avalanche in Denver is at the same time. They started the 95-96 season. And um, so there was quite the rush among broadcasters who wanted to get out of their current situation to get there. I certainly was very interested in it. Turns out John Kelly, the original TV voice of the Lightning, wanted to make that move as well. And he got the job. So Jerry Helper, who I had known in the early Buffalo Rochester days, Jerry was uh, PR director of the Sabres, was involved in the management with the Lightning. and. Um, I really hadn't stayed in touch with him on that, but all of a sudden I get a call from a radio producer, a friend of mine, and said that, uh, hey, the Tampa Bay job's open. So I quickly got a hold of, of Jerry, and uh, things worked out, and thank God they did. My first year I commuted because it came together, you know, like the Hartford deal, pretty late, right before the season began. Wife was teaching, the kids were young, and so forth. And uh, then we eventually moved the following season down here to Tampa and just have loved every second of it. Did you hold on to that interview from the late 60s, early 70s with Phil Esposito? Did you send that as part of your package? <laughs> it's like, I need some luck in this job search. <laughs> yeah, anybody who tells you you don't need luck is full of <laughs> I could have used that. It was very apropos, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, 1995 to present day, it's been a great run for you. Uh, the cup in 04, I'm sure, would be at the top of the list, but what are some of your fondest memories during your time broadcasting for the Lightning? Well, um, certainly the first game at now Amelie Arena, the Ice Palace originally, uh, just to have that game. I mean, it, the energy was just incredible. You couldn't compare it to – it was different than a playoff game because this was – you know, the Lightning finally had a home, and everybody wanted to be there. And 
you know, the, the Lightning are playing the Rangers. They've got, uh, uh, you know, stacked lineup and everything else. They win the game. Brian Bradley scores that first goal. And we had tuxes on. And I'm, my first game working with Chief, we had known each other. Him and his days with the Flyers, because he had been broadcasting there for quite a while, and me with the Whalers. And uh, always enjoyed being around him. So that, uh, you know, it was our first game working together and uh, just in a new situation. Um, well, actually, it wasn't my first game with him because we had done the, the year before and they'd actually been to the playoffs. But just in that situation with Young and our working relationship and just the excitement in that building and to see, to see the team win, it was just a, an incredible moment. As far as from there, um, yeah, you, you know, you think about um, just that run in 03, the 04 stuff, obviously. And then uh, from there, um, you know, moments like Steven Stamko scoring his 60th goal in Winnipeg there at the end of uh, that season, you know, would be some of the highlights, certainly. We are going to miss you greatly. Uh, I think I speak for everyone in the organization, certainly in our travel party. Uh, and I know you're looking forward to doing a lot of the things that you have not had the opportunity to do over your long career. What do you think you maybe are going to miss the most, though, about being involved in the day-to-day? -day? I think just the the back and forth uh, fun that all of us have, as you alluded to, you know, where you spend time on the bus or whatever, and and we're dissecting things about the team or the league or, uh, you know, just having fun with situations and people that we encounter on the road. And, you know, I know game day mornings at home. There, uh, Fox Sports Sun has a little side dressing room where the production crew sets up, and we all just kind of meet in there and shoot the breeze and tell jokes and, and talk about what we had learned from the skate in terms of, um, you know, what had gone on in the locker room for some guys, for me coming off the morning skate set, you know, how things went and, you know, just what the latest stuff is concerned, that kind of stuff, I think. And just the excitement of doing the games. I mean, the, the games themselves, that's the big draw. That's why we're in this thing. And, you know, even now they're, they're as exciting as they were at the start because as I tell people, you know, you never know how a game is going to come out. You don't know what the result is. It's brand new. Every game is brand new. And I think that is something I'm really going to miss too. Well, at the risk of repeating myself, uh, you will be greatly missed. Uh, although I'm glad that we're going to get a chance to see each other, knock on wood later this summer into the fall <laughs> as they try and conclude this 1920 regular season and playoffs. I shouldn't say regular season. I guess uh, the, the round robin games are going to not count toward the regular season, but at least there'll be a little bit of a warm up for us uh, before the playoffs begin. But Rick, I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate you, you spending some time with me and the fans. I learned a lot today and uh, thanks for taking the time to, to share those memories. My pleasure, Mish. Uh, thanks for thinking of me and, and setting this up. Uh, certainly, you know, I talk about things I, I miss. I don't mention the people I'm around because I'm not leaving. And I certainly look forward to seeing a lot of you, a lot of uh, the other people around the, the, the crew and the team. Uh, you know, we'll be at games. We'll be involved in some way, shape, or form. But uh, um, so it's something where – I'm not saying goodbye to a lot of people or fans. I'm going to see them too. So it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I really want to continue associating with, with the Lightning and following the team. It's, it's such a great organization and great to be around uh, people like you. You've done such a fabulous job. You came in at the right time and you met the challenge, Mish, of being the voice of a team that was a championship caliber team, and you've been that ever since. So thank you so much uh, for including me here in your program and uh, best of luck with it. I understand it's, it's a, a new venture basically. Yeah. You know, we're, we're doing some power lunch broadcasts uh, at least in the interim. And uh, as fans are watching this, uh, if they are watching it on zoom uh, or on YouTube, I guess we're going to try and incorporate this uh, on the lightnings website as well. So hopefully as many people get a chance to either watch or listen to this 
really enlightening, interesting conversation as possible. Rick, thanks again. We'll see you soon. All right, look forward to it, Mitch. Thank you.